the next uh, demo, this is actually was hard coded by Stefan Paracode, who uh, talked a lot about performance in the prior session today. Uh, so basically, the idea here is like when you're actually doing a directory on Windows, it's only affecting Windows, and there's a hard link, then it's actually significantly slower than if you don't uh, traverse into those hard links. And I think he ended up with something like a 26x performance difference. So if you had a bunch of hard links like in the Windows folder, then it could take something like, I don't know, minutes, and now it can take seconds to enumerate all those files. And yeah, I so like I will run them both. So, so here we've got uh, PowerShell 7, and then in this one I know it says PWSH, but I just went ahead and launched PowerShell from this one. Um, so the first thing we're doing is building this recursive tree of the Windows directory, and I, props to Stefan, I ripped this example straight from him as well. Um, so we've got these files now. If I run this one, um, and, and the, the speed increase is actually in the formatter. And so what we're doing here is we're, we're piping to format table and then we're sending to out null so that we don't actually see the thing, but we make sure that uh, measure object actually, uh, measure command actually is, is timing the formatter uh, in addition to, to the actual uh, printing of the stuff. Um, but this will take forever. And then if I go over here back to PowerShell 7, um, I think we're looking at like 10 seconds. Don't hold your breath. Yeah. We got plenty of sand, so everything's fine. Um, I think in the other case, it'll probably take minutes. Uh, this one will definitely take yeah. minutes. Uh, this one is done, 12 seconds. Yeah. So uh, I timed this with Jeffrey sitting next to me uh, at the opening ceremony. Uh, the, the, the PowerShell one took seven and a half minutes. Um, so crazy faster in terms of being able to, to print the output. And the, you know, the interesting thing here is that like, this is what we're talking about speed-wise. If anyone's ever experienced where they like, it kind of stutters, and it'll like, kind of pause on a file for a second as it's processing the thing, that's what's been addressed here. Yeah, specifically on the left side, you see the mode. So basically, um, you won't see the L to show it's a hard link because we're not traversing into it. Um, but we do have uh, a different, or Stefan added a different view if you want to see those hard, if you want to see the classic hard link mode. So you'll notice there's one extra dash here on the old Windows PowerShell version, and that's where the, uh, the link was expressed. Um, but I can still go do this guy, which will basically, you know, I can get at the link type as part of the object on the file. So this will say symbolic link, this is hard link, et cetera. Yeah. All right, this next one is, one of the challenges today is if you do a convert to CSV, we pretty much put uh, double quotes around everything. Um, and basically, if it's a number, it becomes a string. So that's been an annoyance for some people. So basically what this allows you to do is specify which fields are actually should have quotes and which ones should not. In reality, you should not need quotes for almost anything other than if it has, if you're using a comma as your separator, a comma in it, or whatever the delimiter is you define. So I forgot to put the quote fields in here. Yes. But I think it was, let's see. Let's call it year. Let's make the put the quotes on the year, just for the heck of it. And then if we cat quote fields, you'll notice this is the only one with quotes around it. It's interesting that we actually quote the header too. That seems like a bug, but anyways, uh, well, somebody can open an issue on that, we can get it fixed. All right, uh, on send mail message, um, this was also brought up uh, by Tobias in the uh, RFC lunch breakout. So one of the things that we've learned is that send mail message is using a bunch of .NET APIs that are no longer considered secure in all cases. So if you're using this within your enterprise, not on the internet, it's probably still perfectly fine to use. Uh, this is assuming that your environment is all secure. Um, but basically, if you're using this on the open internet, then something could downgrade it, and it won't actually be encrypted, even though you think it might be. So we added this obsolete message to indicate um, you know, basically exactly what it says. You can't guarantee that it's secure because the APIs that's being used for this commandlet don't support it. The idea is that in the future, we can figure out there's a bunch of other open source libraries that actually have a lot more capabilities that we can leverage. It's not on plan right now for PowerShell 7, but something we want to revisit in the future because the community feedback is a lot of people actually use this commandlet to send mail. Yeah, and the general point that I want to land here um, is that like .NET, uh, they, they do publish this in their documentation. We use the terms obsolete and deprecation uh, as equivalents. So there is technically a dictionary definition that they are different, um, but we're, we're using them the same here. And in both cases, deprecation and obsolescence do not imply removal. 
So this is an area where we're saying we're disrecommending usage of this commandlet in a bunch of scenarios. We're offering a link to some context uh, with some documentation explaining why that is. But things that are deprecated very often remain there for a very long time. And in fact, someone raised the point, uh, and it's not antithetical to the idea of deprecation, that .NET deprecated the underlying APIs, and then they actually re-implemented them for .NET Core in order to preserve backwards compatibility. Uh, PowerShell lets you shoot yourself in the foot. We offer all kinds of things that are not good to do and not secure that we may or may not warn you about, but that ultimately we're not going to stop you from doing, like using passwords in plain text. Um, put a script analyzer rule that says don't do that, but we're not gonna stop you. So that's what's going on here. We just wanna make sure that everyone has the context that they uh, should have going into using this command line. The question so, is, are there plans to actually fix the, the API? Um, I don't think the .NET team is going to be fixing that API because it's probably more likely to introduce a new set of APIs, which creates the same complication for the commandlet, meaning that we'd have to refactor that command to use the new set of APIs. Uh, I think that for us, we were looking at it more generally, like should we have just a notification commandlet where maybe we can use it to send different types of notification and mail is just one type of that, right? But good question, thank you. All right, so I think for the last demo here, um, people probably, hit, I, like sometimes I'll hit this where, you know, some people may assume by default that the positional parameter for get process is the process ID. It's actually the process name. Um, so many times if you run this, uh, previously it would just say, can I find a process with the name 1234? Um, so the change here, very minor, but it's actually very useful. Say, hey, try it with the dash ID switch or parameter, um, and that just makes it more useful. One of the things I want to highlight here and shout out to all the contributors that, that gave us these delighters, Mohi the Fish, I Sazanov, Power Code, uh, Puget Ta, probably, hopefully. Um, you know, the, the idea here is that this is not a really difficult fix to make, but it is highly useful to a lot of people that are used to using PS uh, on Linux. So the point is you can contribute, like this is stuff that is useful to everybody and doesn't require this insane knowledge of C-sharp or even PowerShell in order to improve the lives of everybody that uses PowerShell. There's a question? Yeah, was this a specific thing for the process or more general for all plans that you're getting this type of feedback? Um, we, I mean, we would like to do these, this more generally. Uh, the, sorry, the question was, are we doing this just specifically for get process or really for everything more generally? Um, I, I don't think that there's anything stopping us from doing this more generally, and we'd love to, but I, I don't think there's any like programmatic way for us to know uh, about stuff like this, um, unless there's like a big problem with name and ID or something like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think the idea here is that we will not ever block these types of PRs coming into PowerShell. We highly encourage them, and if you see opportunities like this, you know, take them. Yeah, I believe this particular fix is specific to Git process, but the concept is pretty general. And I, I think what happened here is like someone from the community opened this issue and someone from the community picked it up and did the implementation. So that's pretty awesome. Yeah, check out the up for grabs issues. Those are often uh, good starter, starter issues for, for getting started with, with implementing or, or contributing. All right. So let's talk about some of the feature explorations that we are doing for PowerShell 7. Now, the caveat I want to offer here is that we are not committing to any of these. These are all places that we are looking at for stuff that's going into 7. We'll eventually have RFCs for all of them. Many of them are deep linked to the original issues where we discuss these things. But ultimately, your feedback is going to drive our prioritization on these things, and anywhere that you feel like maybe you can pick up the mantle uh, where we fall short, uh, there's another opportunity to, to contribute as well. So um, the first two uh, I want to talk through are extensible credential management and extensible log forwarding. So the idea here is that uh, we could offer an extension model. Let's, let's go with the first one, credentials. So in PowerShell, very often we are marshalling credentials between applications, right? We have the idea of a secure string. We have the idea of a PS credential. Uh, but we're more and more interfacing with third-party services and remote services that also help us manage those credentials. So we could be interfacing with Azure Key Vault, uh, HashiCorp's Vault, AWS has an offering, GCP has an offering. There, there are a lot of these things, or even API keys that are coming out of, of you know, uh, SaaS applications. So we've seen a lot of people kind of struggle with this, this need to 
do key rotations and to mirror vaults uh, between multiple services. And so what we'd like to have is some kind of plug-in model that allows uh, services to plug into PowerShell to securely marshal their credentials between, uh, between cloud services and also between cloud services in your local machine. So the idea is like if I have an SSH key, I can, I can sort of get that in a secure way from my local box and then bring it up to Azure Key Vault as a secret uh, or, or do the same in reverse, right? Offer some kind of key that allows me to go get more secrets out of Azure Key Vault and bring them down securely without exposing things in plain text. Similarly for the log forwarding, um, this is one where we want to have a, a kind of pluggable model uh, where I could, could plumb my transcripts. Uh, you know, we, we log all of the command invocations in PowerShell into the event viewer, ETW, uh, or into syslog on Linux and Mac OS, um, but we'd like to have a pluggable model where I can also send those out to some kind of third-party or cloud-based logging service, uh, Azure Monitoring, uh, Splunk, or Datadog, uh, and then do some kind of heuristic analysis, possibly for security reasons, uh, or, or you know, be able to throw alerts uh, to users based off of, of certain behaviors and that sort of thing. So um, these are two areas. RFCs are coming soon. You have anything to add to any of that, Steve? Um, nope. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Moving right along. Um, PS Readline 2.0. Uh, we want to GA this thing. We've been working on it as a beta for a very long time. A lot of these have been accessibility fixes, but we've also just been trying to make it generally more. Uh, compatible with a wider range of terminal emulators across platforms. Uh, with the release of the Windows Terminal Preview that I've been showing off, uh, our job is definitely cut out for us. Uh, there's, there's some issues there that may or may not be on our side of the fence, um, but we want to get this thing up to GA quality and, and ship it out as part of PowerShell 7. This is also an area where I think we're going to deliver the GA back to Windows PowerShell. Um, so, so, you know, this is a, a place where, especially for accessibility reasons, we have to make that investment uh, in Windows PowerShell as an exception to our sort of block on, on new feature work. So one thing I want to add here is many people actually are not aware that for a long time PS Reline was not a Microsoft PowerShell team project. It was started and owned by Jason Shirk, who is a former PowerShell team member, who still contributes actually pretty heavily to PowerShell uh, community. So recently, maybe like, I can't remember now, maybe like a few weeks to a month ago, I had a discussion with Jason, and he agreed that he sh we should transition that project over to my team. So now that it's under me, I'm, I'm planning a bit more resources to it so that we can actually get it to a GA sooner than if it was just a side project for Jason. Now, Jason will still be involved. He's still a maintainer. He'll still review PRs. But now I can actually apply some uh, formal resources to this project. Uh, let me talk about PowerShell Get 3.0. So this was an RFC I published, I think, last week. Um, it has, like, um, based on the lunch breakout, I think it had 169 comments on it already, and I already owe a refresh based on all the comments. Uh, so, again, one of the changes that happened kind of recently last week or so was that I actually took ownership of the PowerShell Git project from one of my peer teams, uh, along with PowerShell Gallery and Package Management. So the first thing I wanted to do was really revisit PowerShell Git and fix some of the annoyances I've seen from the community and also some things that I don't like about it myself. Um, so if you... I'm sure everyone here is probably using PowerShell Git to some capacity. Take a look at that RFC. Um, this is where there's an opportunity to maybe explore some new capabilities that were not in scope for PowerShell Git uh, 2.0. So for example, one of the things I want to resolve is module dependencies, um, providing a way that's built as part of PowerShell Git 3.0 to say, hey, install manage dependencies kind of thing, or install dependencies, and you just have a hash table that says, hey, my project needs these modules, and just install that whole thing. Yeah, if any of you have ever used PS Depends, we, we kind of want to first class that type of behavior uh, so that you can specify version ranges and that sort of thing. Um, one of the important things to note here is that this will introduce a number of breaking changes, uh, but we've had a conversation about the fact that we would like uh, to keep the old PowerShell get side by side for some period of time. We recognize how extensively it's being used and that some of the changes we make um, are going to be very breaking. And so whatever we do here, uh, we're, we're going to not clobber on the same namespace and we're going to make sure that, that people's existing CICD and, and container Docker files and all that sort of thing continue to work. I'll just add, uh, based on some of the feedback from the community, actually, a lot of the breaking changes I had initially anticipated don't have to be breaking. So this is where it was actually really great for the community to call up, here's maybe some alternative ways we could have done certain things. So because of that feedback, uh, as part of my refresh, I'm going to actually remove some language to indicate that it's going to be a big breaking change to just a minor breaking change. Uh, yeah, this, well, this, uh, this, is a real issue. this is the title of the original issue, but what it ended up being is really um, what we covered in the breakout session for lunch, this is Paul's um, RFC, which is to provide a very simple way to do for each parallel. 
So if you're familiar with PowerShell Workflow today, a lot of customers use that specifically just to do parallel execution of run, uh, script blocks very easily. So we want to have that same concept in just PowerShell itself outside of Workflow. Uh, just to be clear, you can do concurrency today in PowerShell perfectly fine, but this is going to provide a very simple way to do that um, if, if you don't want to have to manage threads and jo jobs and whatnot. Yeah, before I upload that one, I will change the title of that because it is uh, it's <laughs> yeah. going to be for each space dash parallel. No, just to be clear. So I, I think we ended up on it will be for each object parallel, but oh, it started okay. out as for each dash parallel, but based on community <laughs> feedback, we were changing that. It's conceptually <laughs> enumeration over an object in parallel. Uh, Improve error formatting. So uh, a lot of people actually find it distasteful to see like five to six lines of red text when they make an error. Try like uh, nine. <laughs> or nine or whatever, however many it is. So this is really kind of revisiting the default formatter for error messages and seeing if we can make it a little bit more uh, concise and short so we can at least make it to the point. And then if you need to see more uh, detailed parts of the error message, you can still get to it because it'll be part of the error object. Um, and one of the other things that we want to maybe do as part of this is really have maybe a different color for non-terminating errors because I think like uh, customers and users get confused by when it's terminating versus non-terminating. It all shows up as red on your console anyways. Um, so having maybe like magenta is my first thought for uh, non-terminating, or maybe yellow, I don't know. Orange is a color, maybe? I don't know. Well, think about that, but that's probably where if you... I'm, did anyone see Walter's talk at the beginning of the day here? Oh, I didn't see yeah, it. Yeah, he, uh, he, he had green error messages. He says they're, just much, they're way less <laughs> aggressive. It just makes me feel like I'm not doing something wrong. I, I'm totally... There he is. I'm maybe, totally yeah. about it. It's uh, like, I think maybe green's the way to go. Maybe red's only for terminating, so... Non-terminating, it's not even a big deal. It's yeah. green. It's just, it's whatever. Just to be clear, like, non-terminating would be like if you're doing a directory <laughs> and, there's, and it hits, you're doing recursively, and one of the folders you don't have access to, like, generally, you can kind of ignore that. You don't care. So why should it show up as red? Um, but anyways, if you have input or if you have suggestions of what you want the air to look like, provide it in that, uh, click that link when these go out. Uh, this is really a borrowing a concept that exists in Bash today. So if you're writing a lot of scripts, and you want to say, hey, when this first part of my pipeline fails, then I don't want to run the rest of it. Because today, you have to provide additional if statements and error handling, stuff like that. Um, the second one with the two ors is really saying, hey, if this part fails, then only run this part, right? So this is really providing a little bit more brevity to, especially when you're doing it interactively uh, to your scripts. This is really just kind of a helper operator. This is uh, actually from Jeffrey. <laughs> so as part of his experience on Azure Stack, there's one of the challenges is uh, when you're building at scale, you know, with a large set of PowerShell scripts calling other PowerShell scripts remotely, it's actually very hard to do error handling and logging and all that. So we're kind of visiting to see if we can do something in the language or some changes to make this easier. It may or may not be what the actual proposal is on the title of the issue. Yeah, I think our last, we, we, Tyler's, Tyler's writing it based on trap, maybe? He already published that one. OK, yeah. yeah. So we were, so we're I should, I should, we, I'll change this hyperlink before we publish well, this to. Don't change it yet, because there's been some pushback on trap. <laughs> okay. All right. Some people really love TriCatch, and they're suggesting we make changes there. So again, I, what I recommend is clicking on this link. Um, it should, we should probably add the RFC to this issue so that you can actually provide comments on the RFC, not on the issue. Um, and then we can land on what we think is the right uh, syntax for this. But I think this shows you guys, too, like, this is a messy process for us, right? And it's kind of supposed to be. Um, we have to go through a lot of iterations and a lot of discussion, both internally and with you guys, to make sure that we're doing the right thing here. Because whatever we eventually commit is going to be there for a very long time. And we need to make sure that we're, we're not putting ourselves in a position where we're stuck with something that turned out to be the wrong design choice. So, you know, it's, it is very true. Like, we had ubiquitous on air as a script block, and then we had a very long discussion about try catch, and we landed on the ability to do trap. And then by the time we came back around, it sounds like maybe try catch is the way to go. But this is, you know, it's a very iterative, sort of looped process, uh, which is why these things take time. And that's, that's very much by design. I think this is the, that's not the last one. So, Three more. Uh, ternary conditionals, if you're a C-sharp or a regular developer, you're very familiar with this. Otherwise, um, basically what this is, is if you do something, and you have like if some condition, then you set something like A equals 1, else, you know, B equals 2 kind of thing. This is really a syntactical sugar to really make that much more terse. Um, if you understand it, it actually makes the code a lot more readable, because now it's all in one similar line versus spread out across multiple lines. Uh, null conditionals is a similar kind of concept where today you would have to say if null equal equal or dash equal uh, foo, then, you know, then do something. So in this case, you don't have to do all these null checks. You can actually have uh, some syntax in the language to say 
If it's null, then do this. If it's not null, then do something else. Uh, new version. Okay, so one of the things when we looked at our PowerShell GitHub BI report, you know, in terms of the adoption of PowerShell, is that some people are taking a long time moving from 6.1 to 6.1.1 to 6.1.2. And I think part of that is they may not just know that there's a new version available, right, even within that version. And the reason we have these servicing releases typically is for security fixes. We're picking up from either .NET Core or for ourselves. So the idea here is like we want people to have some way to notify. Like if you have VS Code, today it tells you there's a new version available. And PowerShell Core doesn't do that at all. So we're gonna add a, we want to add a check so that at startup, and this will, some of the goals is not to impact performance um, and not to run all the time. But basically the idea is to tell you, hey, there's a new servicing patch. You should really install it. We're not going to install it for you, but we'll tell you that there's a newer version available. Awesome. So we're going to keep it cranking here. We got eight minutes until Q&A. Um, I might eat into the Q&A a little bit here, but uh, just know I'm going to be here all week, both of us. You can ask us questions. This is why we're here. So um, let's talk a little bit about module compatibility. This is probably one of the number one blockers based on talking to you, uh, based on the telemetry we have, et cetera. Uh, we believe is one of the number one blockers to people moving to PowerShell Core. Um, so today, after a very strong effort in the server 2019 timeframe, uh, where Steve and his team uh, made a lot of changes to modules that we didn't actually own in order to bring them up to compatibility, we now have over 60% of the inbox Windows 10 and Windows Server modules working in PowerShell Core, um, including Active Directory. And we actually had a Twitter conversation this morning uh, where some folks were asking if, if AD was now supported in Core. It is, but you need to upgrade to the latest version through either the, the latest RSAT on Windows 10 or the server 2019 where Active Directory ships. And, and that's really gonna be the case going forward. When we make these changes into Windows, unfortunately those changes are not gonna go down level to older versions of Windows, uh, but as you're able to move forward in your operating system, PowerShell 7 uh, and, and 6.2 likely will, will become more and more compatible with those. Um, Another big one is Azure PowerShell. They recently released a, a massive refactor of the Azure RM module called AZ. AZ is fully supported in both Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Core. Uh, SQL Server has been growing uh, its ability to uh, be compatible with PowerShell Core for a long time. There was a, a small subset of commandlets that worked in, in Core, uh, and that's been growing very rapidly uh, in, in no small part to uh, the evangelism of, of our, our friends at DBA Tools, uh, uh, Chrissy and Rob. And then additionally, there are, including the AZ modules, 284 total modules in the gallery that have been marked as core. Um, we actually want to work with module owners in the future to help them mark their modules as core because we believe that a lot of popular modules already work just fine in core, but just need to be annotated as such. In the future, we've got Exchange Online, Azure AD, Intune, and more of these Windows modules as we go into the next Windows milestone in PowerShell 7. Uh, some of these already ship inside of Cloud Shell, and we're working with those teams to productize those modules um, and deliver them either with their typical distribution method or, or even possibly on the gallery. We ask that for those modules that are not compatible, that you please file feedback with the product owners uh, that own that thing that the module is managing. So if you believe that you know Exchange Online, for instance, needs to work in PowerShell Core, please tell that to the team that owns Exchange Online. Um, we work with those teams very closely, but it's a lot easier for us uh, to push them to do that work if the feedback is coming from you guys uh, in terms of, of what's compatible and what's not. Um, we also have a module coverage repo that's not super well maintained today, but that we'll be dipping into more and more. Um, and this is sort of our own uh, uh, issue-based repo to just keep track of all the modules that people care about and, and what still needs to be ported. You have anything to add there? Nope. So Script Analyzer, who, who's used Script Analyzer before? OK, keep your hands up or raise them if you've also used VS Code PowerShell. Right, so then you've used Script Analyzer before. Awesome. Um, so this thing is integrated into VS Code PowerShell, uh, but you can use it as a standalone or in CICD pipelines. And it basically gives you some best practices around what you should and should be doing. Uh, for instance, having a fully plain text uh, password parameter, you know, that's, that's of type string, not a good idea, or using uh, colloquial aliases inside of scripts that are intended for reuse is not a good idea because folks can change their, their aliases within their own environments. Um, and so for some of these, we even offer like a quick fix button, this little light bulb that shows up, and that'll auto expand your alias into the full, full commandlet name. Um, but most notably, we recently introduced an update to Script Analyzer that includes a set of catalogs and rules that help you determine whether or not a script is likely to be compatible with a given operating system, a given version of PowerShell, 
or a given version of .NET Framework. And so we go through and do some analysis on the, not just the commandlet names, uh, but the parameters that they have and a lot of the language features. Um, and in the future, we're going to be analyzing more of the .NET types that, that are used with add type and static methods, um, as well as offering some recommendations in the future. So I'm just going to show that real quick. Uh, we've got these script analyzer compatibility rules. If I just pop over to this guy. So this is just a script um, that just has some random stuff in it, a couple different examples. Um, I've set up a PS script analyzer settings file ahead of time. This is in the same folder as the module. Um, and you'll notice I'm, I'm enabling uh, the PS use compatible commands rule. Um, and I've set up some target profiles uh, that include the, the kinds of platforms that I want to target. Uh, there's a blog post we link to that explain these profiles in more detail. Um, and you can also generate your own catalogs uh, from a given environment. So if you've built a golden image on a specific machine and it's got some extra modules, those uh, can actually get generated into a profile to be used in the same kind of analysis. Um, but you'll see here we've got the processor architecture. Um, this Win 8 is a bit of a misnomer uh, because the actual OS version is right here, this 10.0.14.393. Um, you'll see 6.2, I think that's like a Win 7 or Win 8.1. Um, and then over here, uh, we've got the version of PowerShell 3.0, 5.1, 6.1.3. Uh, and then the version of .NET, which is largely a, a phony number for .NET Core, um, but is totally legitimate for .NET Framework, right? We've also said PS use compatible syntax. This is the one that checks for the language rules themselves, and we've targeted versions 3, 5, 1, and 6, 2. And so if I switch back over here to this demo, um, you'll notice I say get module list available, I pipe to outgrid view, and if I hover over this green squiggly, it will say that the command outgrid view is not available in 6, 1, 3 which many of you know. Uh, here with invoke command, this one's a little more specific. Invoke command's available everywhere, but we added the dash host name parameter to support SSH-based remoting, uh, which is only available in six and above. And so if I hover over this one, it'll tell me, hey, dash host name isn't there in 5.1 or 3.0, which can be very helpful. Uh, and here I'm using the colon colon new syntax to do a, a construction uh, of a HTTP request object, and that's a language feature that uh, was not supported in PowerShell 3 or 4. And so the error message complains about that as well. So again, we want to offer possibly quick fixes for this thing in the future. This one in particular could be quick fixed into a new object invocation. Um, some of them can't be automatically fixed, but we could still offer some kind of recommendation about how you refactor it. Um, but we think that a lot of modules are one or two lines away from fully working. Um, and actually, if I just go here to problems, um, this will allow me to see for a specific file um, exactly all of the warnings that, that are uh, a problem. So um, definitely check this out, uh, pretty cool. Works great for helping you to port your stuff over. Let me just add one thing on yeah, script analyzer is that there's ongoing work to improve performance. So I think the next release of uh, PS script analyzer, I don't know when that will happen, but should already have some per, uh, perf improvements. And it. actually, the last one I think had a number the last of one had it as well, but we're um, continuing to make some because uh, we know like especially the integration with VS Code because it's there by default. Um, it can be a little bit sluggish of when you see those squiggly lines disappear because you fix something. Um, so it's something we're addressing, but it's going to take some time. We're also doing some changes in VS Code PowerShell to change, I think, when we call Script yes. Analyzer, how we call it. So there's stuff happening on both sides of the fence. Um, and we do package Script Analyzer with the VS Code PowerShell extension. So uh, as long as you just keep that up to date, you should be getting the benefits of both if you're, if you're only using it in that VS Code scenario. Um, shout out to Chris Bergmeister. Uh, he's one of the maintainers of Script Analyzer. I know we got the 15 <laughs> minutes of questions. It's, we're out of sand. Um, <laughs> Shout out, you know, he's, he's one of the maintainers of Script Analyzer and has been doing a ton of this perf work, and, and really uh, we would not be in as good a place as we are without him, so thanks. So just really quickly, uh, a word on RFCs. Um, so this is the process that we use, again, for specifying features that we want to ship into PowerShell 7, new work that we're thinking about doing, offering alternative implementations. The process, again, it's very iterative. We're... We sort of work through these RFCs over time. We offer a minimum of 30 days before uh, we choose to, to do an implementation of something, uh, or at least before we accept the RFC. Um, increasingly, we're exploring ways to implement experimental versions, either behind experimental feature flags, 
uh, or otherwise so that we can sort of test a feature out. Very often you, you, you can't understand whether something is going to break in a lot of scenarios unless you, you have an example of it. Uh, you know, so if we want to be more agile uh, as opposed to this sort of very waterfall-based process of, of writing a spec, discussing it, and not writing any code for, for a few months, uh, you know, we, we, we want to do this more rapid iteration, but we also don't want to risk uh, devaluing the platform or setting ourselves up for breaking changes in the future. And so experimental feature flags sort of give us a way uh, to, to do that. Um, in regards to breaking changes, um, we apply, uh, uh, or at least I do, uh, uh, apply in when, when I'm making my committee decisions. Everybody sort of has a different heuristic a little bit for how we, how we approach uh, breaking changes. Um, but my favorite way to look at them is to, to really ask two questions. Um, one of those is, how badly do I think this breaking change is going to impact the community? And that's in terms of, uh, you know, how often is this being done? And also, how bad is the break when it occurs? So if the break is, you know, oh, I throw a, um, you know, maybe a different uh, warning message or something like that, um, then obviously that's, that's not going to be a big break even if a lot of people are impacted by it. Um, but uh, if something is, is only happening in 1% of cases, but is a catastrophic breakage and failure, like say removing send mail message, um, then that's obviously going to be a significantly more negative experience if we make that breaking change. Um, so that's the first question we ask. And then the, the opposite question is, okay, if we make the change, how much value is provided to the community uh, by making that change? And so there's, there's a high bar in terms of both uh, something being beneficial and also affecting a lot of people. Um, one thing we don't really like to do is to make a change for the sake of consistency without re a really strong example of why that additional consistency is going to help the community. Very often people feel like, oh, there's this one thing that's an exception in PowerShell and it really, it just really bothers me that that's not exactly the same as all the other ways that, that that's done in a commandlet. Um, and if, you know, renaming the parameter doesn't actually uh, uh, help anyone except that person who's bothered by it, um, then, then we're inclined to really skip over that and just accept it as a piece of PowerShell legacy. Um, I think the only thing I'll add here is uh, I think RFC is, is probably the easiest, lowest, cheapest way to provide uh, value to the community. So the uh, only thing you need is really a GitHub account, and those are free. Um, and the other thing is, if you follow me on Twitter, I will try to be uh, more um, timely in posting when there's new RCs posted, because I know that not everyone monitors what's happening on GitHub. Um, but definitely, if we have an RC and we implement it, and you didn't provide that feedback, then it's going to be very hard for us to now adjust that implementation to fit your scenarios. I was just pointing out the Twitter oh. accounts in the corner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, definitely follow us both and PowerShell team. Um, I, you know, I, I, can, I can keep going here. I know I want to have time for questions, but we, we recognize we're moving slowly on these things. We're increasingly have more and more quorum. Bruce and Kenneth come by a lot. Um, we want to move more towards asynchronous communication. We're exploring ways we can bring community members into the committee uh, and, and really put more of the, the discussion that we're having uh, as both the output of our decisions, so having more detailed notes when, when we decide to approve or reject an RFC or, or an issue that's controversial, uh, but also to communicate amongst each other in a more asynchronous way and not just behind closed doors in a meeting room. Um, very often we need to have those private conversations because they're more accelerated um, and we can be a little bit more terse uh, and direct about what we think about features, uh, but at the same time we do want to expose more of that thinking uh, to folks outside that room. Um, and so we're, we're exploring more ways to do that. Um, I do want to call out a, a, a non-goal here is to lower the time to immediate implementation, right? It very much is a feature of this process that it takes a little while and that people have to think about the implications of a change before we go and implement it and, and change the platform in, in one direction or another. Um, I think we talked about all this stuff at the state of the shell, so I'm gonna go ahead and skip over this one. Um, these are questions I really, like, like we can have this more async as well, um, but, but really we want to understand the blockers for, for folks moving to PowerShell Core and for folks moving to Visual Studio Code. Um, so like, like, we'll just do really quickly, raise your hand if one of the biggest reasons you don't use PowerShell Core is because it's not built into Windows. Okay. For how many of you is it because there's a module that is incompatible and if it was compatible you'd switch? Great. Keep your hands up if it's Active Directory and you're stuck on an old version of Windows. <laughs> Okay, put your hands down and tell me if it's Office 365. Okay, 
Um, something else. Yell them out. Exchange. System Center. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Say that one more time. Oh, you're stuck on 2.0 and 3.0? I have to write scripts for multiple customers, so I have to adapt to what the customer has implemented. Okay. Thank you. Power CLI uh, is mostly compatible now. They actually shipped it on the gallery. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Okay. Citrix. Exchange. Cool. Right, so the, the concern is, hey, I might be able to install 6.2 on my dev box, but if I'm deploying to some servers that need 5.1 or whatever, then maybe uh, that script's going to be incompatible. And to you, I would implore you to check out those script analyzer rules to see if they help you bridge that gap. Um, but one of the big things is, you know, we do support side-by-side, -side, um, so you can test on a machine with both 5.1 and 6.2. We recognize that that's less desirable, um, but, but it, is, it is an option there. Outgrid view. Outgrid view, show object, we totally hear you. We're looking into it, NetCore 3. Um, awesome. I think that kind of covers it for me. It was pretty much what I th knew already, which is actually great, um, because we are everything we're doing is to move in a direction to address all those. Um, is it startup time for anyone? Does anyone think PowerShell Core, it's so much slower to start? Great. We worked really hard on driving that down. It's only a couple hundred milliseconds more. Um, how about hosting in a .NET framework application? Like, you've got some old dashboard that's built in WPF, and you, okay, cool, got a couple of those, cool. Um, and how about with Visual Studio Code, the fact that it's not built into Windows, who's, like, is that a big deal for anybody? Yeah? All right, uh, and the debugging experience, the fact that it's maybe not as stable, okay. And then PS read line support. So it's increasingly closer. Um, we're very, very close at this point. There's like one little extra step you got to do to make the F8 totally work with debugging, which is to click a little drop down and, and add a built-in task. Um, but otherwise, the integrated console supports all of the features of the ISC that, that share state so that if you define a variable in the lower session, then it becomes available to tab completion in the editor and that sort of thing. So um, I implore everybody who hasn't tried it in a while to give it another try. We've made a lot of progress there, um, and it's very similar to an ISC experience. We also have a doc uh, specifically about if you're an ISC user coming over to VS Code, how you can make it more and more like ISC uh, through some of the configurations. So um, we'll link to that. You can check it out. Um, Let me just caught one thing before we yep. run out of time. Yep. So I, I think a lot of people may not realize this, but in VS Code, when we have the integrated terminal, it's a real terminal. You can run like interactive commands in there that prompt you and all that. ISC, you cannot do that. Like ISC, it really doesn't have a true terminal. It, it basically takes whatever the input is, it runs it, and then it puts out the output, right? So if you do like net use and it prompts you for the password, that doesn't work in ISC because it's not designed for that. Whereas in VS Code, it's a real terminal, so all that just works. Yes, yeah, so there's basically the question is, does it also, there's the corollary of that that you don't have some of the bad features of ISC, like the inability to sort of reset your run space without closing the whole thing and that sort of thing. And the answer is yes. Like all you have to do is pop the command palette. I think it's like control shift P on Windows um, and just type restart and it's going to come up right there with like PowerShell restart current session and that'll just restart your run space and, and not change anything else with what you're doing in VS Code. So great question. Um, that's nice for playing around, and it's like the full PowerShell for everything else. So maybe that's 
something communication-wise? Yeah, so the, the question or the comment was, hey, like I get the sense because PowerShell Core uh, is sort of this alternative PowerShell rather than a successor to Windows PowerShell, um, and that's sort of exacerbated by the fact that we support Raspberry Pis and uh, all these kind of funky architectures and that it's more of kind of a toy than, than a really full PowerShell and that Windows PowerShell is the one for like getting real work done. Um, it's definitely not the message we want to be pushing. Um, I can understand how, how you might have been uh, led in that direction, and I think uh, you're sort of confirming to me that the seven nomenclature is important for the specific reason of really driving home the point that this is the true successor to, to Windows PowerShell and that we really want everybody to be using this. It's much more powerful uh, than Windows PowerShell once the coverage feature has been addressed. So. Um, I'm going to throw up this call to action slide. Um, a lot of this has already been stated, but just update to the latest release. Please play around with six, play around with seven. Talk to us. Tell us what you love. Tell us what you hate. Join our community calls. Take down this aka.ms link. Those are the third Thursdays of every month. For those of you in Europe, uh, we do them at 9 a.m. PST, so I think that comes out to like 5 or 6 o'clock here. Um, 6 o'clock, or, or 6.30 actually, excuse me, because we do them at 9.30. Um, so definitely join those. Um, we do do them at that time so that folks in, in Europe are able to join as well. Um, we've had a couple kinks with the Teams call and all that, but um, check it out. Uh, same thing with RFCs. Check out our other repos, file issues. Uh, check out our contributions guides. Um, please, 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 uh, you know, everything we do is up on GitHub. So, so come just tell us, tell us what you need and, and uh, hopefully we can sort you out. I think that's it. If you have any other questions, Joe and I are here the whole week, so. You do one more. I th all right. Uh, so where are we with uh, DSC support for PowerShell 7? So the question is, hey, what about DSC support for PowerShell 7? You snuck one in there right at the end here. We have one, <laughs> one more quick one, right? Um, Sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, so we've been, we've been exploring more of sort of how we can integrate with DSC. You know, I think Michael Green's spoken pretty extensively publicly about the fact uh, that the, the sort of LCM v2 is hidden behind uh, an Azure service right now and that we're using that pretty significantly for uh, uh, change tracking and guest configuration and that sort of thing. Um, that code does exist. It supports PowerShell Core. It supports Windows and Linux. Um, the issue there is really the, the delivery mechanism for people in the guest. Um, it's the fact that you know, we're installing this in a very custom, very internal way uh, that, that's not as easily exposed to customers uh, as we're doing it in, inside of Azure. Um, there's an additional issue uh, of the sort of side-by-sideness, right? Like it's not built at all to be supported in an environment where the LCM v1 might be turned on. Um, and then additionally, there's, there's been no work really done on the, uh, the poll server side. Um, and and uh, you know we, we don't really plan on investing in, in that area specifically. Um, we've been having some conversations with the, the DSC team about some, some smaller uh, sort of tactical stuff that we can do in the shorter term. For instance, the ability to run uh, invoke DSC resource from PowerShell Core so that even if you don't have an orchestrator like the LCM, uh, you can still leverage some kind of external orchestrator like uh, Chef, Puppet, Ansible, or Azure Automation, or Azure Functions, um, and, and still be able to reach into DSC resources and execute the get, the set, and the test uh, with, with a little bit more uh, uh, customness um, and really empower some of those configuration management platforms to take more advantage of all the coverage that we've already built in this space. Um, but again, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're still working through what that looks like and the timeline, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that we're saying we're not gonna do, like DSC's not going away anytime soon, it's very, very useful. We ship the resource kit every month. Uh, you know, there's progress being made uh, all across that ecosystem, um, but we're, we're still, we, we wanna do the right thing in PowerShell Core, and, and so there's still, still, still a lot of conversation going on there. But thank you for the question. So we're over time, uh, we will step outside. You can come hound us uh, as I get some coffee, and, and uh, Steve, you know you don't drink coffee, do you? No, I don't. Yeah. So, uh, Water. Awesome water, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs>